He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. This man jumps out of a car, brandishing a firearm, and basically tells the little girls to get away, tells Donna to go and tie the dog up, and as she's doing that, he lifts baby Kahu and just takes off with her. This is Crimes NZ, and I'm your host, Jesse Mulligan. For the last episode in this season, we're looking into the kidnapping of baby Kahu. In 2002, an armed stranger snatched Kahu and held her for ransom for nine long days. Anna Leesk, the senior crime and justice reporter for the New Zealand Herald, has revisited this case for her podcast, A Moment in Crime. It was sort of before I became a journalist, but it was certainly one that um, I watched yeah. um, with fascination as it was sort of unfolding. And, and looking through at your notes, I can't believe it lasted nine days. I mean, you know, as a parent, it is a horrific thing to think about, but I, I remember it being resolved. But that's a long time to not know where your daughter is. It is, and absolutely, if you look at, you know, some of the manhunts and things we have now, they seem to be resolved yeah. so quickly, so it's hard to believe that this drew out for nine days, as you say. So let's begin with Baby Kahu, and um, she was, I think, adopted by Donna Hall and her husband. She was. So Donna had um, really sadly lost a baby um, a few years earlier. She was seven months pregnant and lost the baby due to spina bifida. So the family sort of had discussions, and it was agreed that if another baby was born that... Um, the child would be placed with Donna and Eddie just to give them that chance of experiencing parenthood. So when her sister fell pregnant um, with baby Kahu, that was decided that she would go and live with Donna and Eddie. And on the morning of April 13th, 2002, so how old would baby Kahu have been then? She was about eight months old. Okay, so probably having a nap as her mum took her for a walk. Uh, How did the abduction play out? So Donna had taken the baby, her two nieces and the family dog for this walk around their neighbourhood. Pretty normal walk. Which Um, neighbourhood, sorry? um, In Porirua, I believe, Mm -hmm. so near Wellington. And then as they were walking around, this man jumps out of a car brandishing a firearm and basically tells the little girls to get away, tells Donna to go and tie the dog up. And as she's doing that, he lifts baby Kahu and just takes off with her, Um, you know, jumps in the car and goes to drive away. Donna actually tried to stop the car physically and almost got run over herself, so it must have just been terrifying. And um, what was her... I see here was Hutt River, Woburn. Um, What was her description of the man? Like, what... You know, what what did he look like? Was he in disguise or...? He was in disguise. He was wearing um, balaclava and he he had gloves, so he was pretty... um, nondescript. It was just a man that came at them out of absolutely nowhere. So yeah. just walking around their neighbourhood on, you know, the normal family walk. And, um, I mean, you have been working in the crime and justice round for a long time in your career. How unusual is it for something like this to happen? At the time, it was pretty unprecedented, and we haven't seen anything like it since. Um, yeah, you get the occasional kidnapping through, you know, the court system that we follow through. It's... Um, usually with adults, not with kids. So this was a huge case. Um, You know, we we talk about it now, and even looking back, it was like something out of a movie rather than something that happens in the suburbs of, you know, wider Wellington. Yeah. So presumably she got straight in touch with police, and and how did they act? Well, police went immediately um, door-to-door, just basically converged on the suburb, and um, I think by the end of the day they had 50 officers out there just canvassing the neighbourhood. Um, They put out a description of the man and the car. Um, And then within, you know, the first couple of days, they had the family fronting media, you know, appealing for the baby to be returned. And a hotline was set up, so they had 100 calls to that in the first day and nothing of any um, help, really. So, you know, huge police presence, but not, not much information in that first sort of period. And and they talked to the mother and father, Donna Hall and Eddie Jury, and, and neither of them really had any suspects, no one who was on their radar. Absolutely not. And it was just so strange. There was there was no one. You know, he was a judge and she was a high-profile lawyer and, you know, they arguably would be the sort of couple that could potentially think of people that might mm. be vexed at them or, you know, have a, an axe to grind, but there was just no one that... Um, 
that was, you know, could be highlighted at the time. And eight or nine months old is incredibly young for a baby and uh, understandably, um, Kaho's mum was worried about her and she released a short statement um, saying baby Kay is an innocent little girl. She can't speak, walk or even crawl. She needs regular feeding and to be kept warm. And then there was also a direct plea to the kidnapper from Donna and we've got that audio here, so um, let's have a listen to that. You know who you are and you know me. You put a rifle at my niece's head and told me you would shoot them if we didn't do what you wanted. You wanted the dog removed and then you took Kahuro Tere. You can put this right now because if she's frightened and I'm very frightened, I would think that you would be frightened too. Pretty chilling to listen to, isn't it? Yeah. Um, she gave the uh, the person who'd taken the baby a, a bit of instruction uh, how to take care of her. She implored him to drop the baby off at a church and she seemed pretty certain that the kidnapper was watching. I'm, I'm sure that she spoke to police about the best sort of approach to take there. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's still amazing that she was so composed, um, you know, so calm in that delivery. But I think the aim would have been to just appeal to the kidnapper's sense of humanity um, in the hope that, you know, speaking directly to that person, using the baby's name over and over again, making sure that he knew she was a, a real human, someone that needed care. Um, you know, she's a baby. She needed him for everything at that point. Um, and I, I think reminding him of that was probably hugely important at that point. Here's Detective Inspector Stuart Wilden um, talking about the early stages of the investigation and he's talking with Checkpoint's John McDonald, confident the kidnapper was watching Donna's appeal. What we have at this stage is a, uh, a list of names of possible suspects which have been supplied to us um, uh, during our inquiries. Uh, we'll be visiting each of those people and um, speaking to them about... Uh, incidents uh, that occurred on on Saturday and, of course, whether or not they have uh, any knowledge of it. But we don't have any specific um, suspect lined up at this stage. How many people are these you're talking about? Look, we have a handful at this time, but that that is likely to grow. Uh, Certainly with um, the information coming in from members of the public, uh, that list will get bigger and it's going to provide uh, uh, further work for us. So, no idea who it could be, no idea of the motive, and then, as they suspected, the kidnapper got in touch with Donna and her husband. What happened there? Well, police intercepted a letter um, that got sent in the mail to their home. Um, now, in this in this envelope was a letter addressed to the family with some pretty firm instructions on what the kidnapper wanted and when. Um, there were five Polaroid photos of baby Kahu. Now, she's sitting on a couch with a newspaper article behind her, um, that was showing the date. Now, the note said that she was alive and well and he'd bring her home safe for three million dollars and he sort of gave very specific instruction on the denominations he wanted that money in and you know quite scarily he said if there was any any interference from police or the ransom wasn't paid that um donna and eddie wouldn't see baby car whoever again so it must have been absolutely terrifying for them three million dollars is a lot of money uh, now but even then in 2002 um and he had some instructions about um sending him a message once they decided what to do. Yeah, and Donna, you know, I think an ad was put in the Herald and they communicated that way. And then he was able to call a number and have direct contact with her and um, he would leave the baby in the house where he had her and drive to different towns and make these calls to Donna and I think that's exactly how police sort of twigged so as to who he, he was. Yeah, so she played along. Uh, Donna put the ad in the paper. He actually even specified what she want, what he wanted it to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tommy, bunnies are ready to run. Call me. Uh, and so he did call her. She answered, and uh, he asked if the money was ready, and she said yes. Uh, he re- reiterated there was to be no police involvement. And then what happened? Well, police managed to track him down to this house and they basically started watching the house, working out when he was leaving and what he was up to. It was a payphone, wasn't it? 
Yes, it was. I think he went um, to, was it Tiawamutu, to, to make the calls, um, which was, you know, more than an hour away from the hut. From, from Tamaranui, from yeah. where he had the baby. So, that it's, you know, it's quite a gamble, him leaving the baby alone for that long to make these calls. He was obviously pretty confident in what he was doing and his yeah. plan. So he made a call from a payphone, and then he called a couple of other people by the sounds of things, and that's how they ended up tracking him. Yeah. So they were able to, you know, finally hone in on the suspect and um, absolutely no connection to Donna or Eddie, so fascinating. Yeah, it was a nice little piece of uh, detective work. Telecom told them what the phone box was. They found out the calls he'd made afterwards and then they called the same people that he had and said, hey, who just rung you? Yeah. <laughs> and they said 54-year-old Terence Trainer. Now tell us about him. So Terence Trainer, um, he was born and raised in the Lower Hutt area, uh, left for Australia in the 70s, and basically from the time he left, he had little to no contact with his family, um, not even when his father died in 74. In 87, he was jailed for eight years for armed robbery in Western Australia, and when he was released from prison there, he was deported back here. Uh, now, he settled in a little rental house on Waiheke Island, kept to himself. He had a bit of a love of um, native plants, and so he was doing that. Uh, at one stage, he was married. Um, they had a child, a little boy, who tragically died when he was five, um, and then that marriage ended. So, uh, you know, definitely a, a troubled life um, and a sad life with losing his son. OK, so police had their man and then they found out where he was living. I guess they presumed that this place in Tamaranui um, was where he was staying, you know, close-ish to Te Aumutu. And so they started staking it out. Yeah, and it's a property that he'd purchased, so it was in his name. Um, so not a not a huge stretch once police had yeah. a name for him. Um, so they started surveillance on that house and uh, it was when he left to make another call to Donna that um, police swooped in and were able to you know, ascertain that baby Kahu was there and was alive and well. So um, then we had armed police waiting there, obviously converged on the little sort of settlement and were hiding all around the property, waiting for him to come back. Um, and then they really got their man. What did they find inside? And we should uh, emphasise, by the way, it's, it sounds like the baby was really well cared for, um, considering over that eight- or nine-day period he had this thermos of warm milk. Um, he obviously had a bit of experience. He'd picked up nappies on the way through from um, from Wellington to Tamaranui. But what did they find when they went inside? It sounded like um, he'd actually created a whole sort of um, room for this project. Yeah, so the house had been he'd purchased specifically and then he'd renovated it. So he'd put, um, you know, extra walling up to, you know, mask sound, um, you know, windows were covered and he'd actually made sort of shutters for them that locked from the inside. Um, he sort of had an, an area around the toilet and bathroom that was all enclosed so he could keep someone in there and they couldn't access the rest of the house. Um, so he'd done a lot of work there with the soundproofing and, you know, making sure that once his his victim was in there, they wouldn't get out or be heard. Um, now, the purchase of the house was pretty specific as well. It was sort of back off the road and not close to any neighbours, so... Mm. He'd put a lot of work into it. He'd been planning something like this. Absolutely. And however, as it turned out, the, the, the child, the family that he eventually targeted was a bit random, really. He had no particular vendetta against them. He'd picked them from, from where? A rich list that was published in a Sunday paper. So Trainer had decided that we had become fixated on getting money from someone wealthy, someone rich and famous. Um, and so he'd spent years sort of planning what he was going to do and he just needed to work out who he was going to target. Now, he, in 2001, one of the Sunday papers published the rich list as they often did, and um, he picked Donna Hall. So she was the initial target. He was going to take Donna herself. Um, but, you know, as his plan sort of moved through, he decided it would be far easier to take the baby. Here's a small, uh, very small piece from a police interview with uh, Terence Trainer, and uh, we've located the thanks to the friends at Ngā Taonga Sound Archives. Here he is speaking with police. You have done a lot of preparation. Yeah. Tell, you tell me through that. Tell me about that. Well, I, like I said before, I was originally intending to kidnap Donna. Yeah, he was originally intending to kidnap Donna and he'd done a bit of detective work himself to track down where, um, to finding her name on the rich list, finding out where she lived, and he sounded like he'd been sort of watching the family for a while. Yeah, so he found their address in the electoral roll and then 
he travelled to Lower Hutt and stayed at a campground and he'd spend his time sort of following Donna and sitting outside the house watching the comings and goings, sort of learning her routine. Um, And while he was doing that, you know, taking notes and making his plans, he sort of realised that it'd be far easier to take this baby. And I think, you know, I guess he assumed people would be a lot more willing to part with $3 million to to get a little helpless baby back. Mm. Um, So he, he switched his whole plan around, you know, leaving Donna out and targeting that that small child. And so what, once police had interviewed him, what did we learn about what happened that day, how he um, went from the, the abduction to, to Tomaranui? Well, he left, the car he left in, so he'd put baby Kahu in the car with him, um, he had hired a storage facility nearby, so he went and dumped that car and then took his own, uh, went back to the campground and he stayed there with the baby, fed her the milk that he'd bought and just waited there for three or four hours because he just... Pretty high be... risk, by the way, isn't it? Absolutely. To take a baby to a campground yep. in the area that you've uh, kidnapped from. And he'd stayed there before because that's where he'd stayed while he was, you know, stalking the family effectively. But he, he stayed at this caravan for three or four hours because he thought there might be roadblocks in the area. And then he, um, you know, put the wee baby in the car. He sort of fashioned a... a some sort of mattress car seat situation in the back and drove her to the house. So when they found him, arrested him, uh, presumably they wanted to get baby Kahu back to her parents as soon as possible. Yeah, so she was taken straight to um, a doctor to get checked out. Um, the police could see from the get-go that she was had been well cared, cared for and there was no sort of visible signs of any... Um, major damage to her and the the doctor was the same. You know, she'd been fed, she was hydrated. Um, she's a little bit grisly as as they are. Um, and they actually chucked her in the Eagle helicopter, the police helicopter, and they yeah. flew her home. Um, so it was a 45-minute flight and she slept the whole way. So when she got back to... When they took her into that police station to Donna and Eddie, she'd had a, a great big nap and she was quite fine. <laughs> hmm. Slept well that night too, slept right through. Wow. Well, and, well, you can imagine um, how grateful the parents are feeling at this point. Um, Donna Hall and Eddie Drew met her at Wellington Airport and through police thanked the nation for their support. Um, they said words can't express what we truly feel. Thank you so very much. And then there was the trial and no problems convicting this guy? No. So the day that he was arrested, he sort of gave up everything to the police and he said... Um, He had no intention of hurting the baby, that he'd done it and put his hands up. Um, He got to court and pleaded guilty to five charges relating to the kidnapping, as well as rendering Hall incapable of resistance and threatening to kill her little nieces, also using a crime, a pistol, and committing a crime. So um, he pleaded guilty and was sentenced really soon after that to 11 years in prison. Okay, and here's Donna Hall's reaction to that. We are very pleased that he has pleaded this way because it means at a very practical level that my two nieces will not have to give evidence in a long, drawn-out case. So, yes, we're indeed relieved that that pressure was taken off them. And here's Judge Craig Thompson, who sentenced Trainer to 11 years and talking about how serious the snatching was. The person kidnapped was a vulnerable, defenceless infant who had no prospect of independent resistance or escape. In my view, where the victim is an infant whose parents know full well that she is totally dependent on others for her very survival, that anguish and that fear is unimaginably acute. Might be just because I'm a dad, but 11 years doesn't seem like enough. It was a pretty shocking crime. what What he put the family through. Absolutely. So that was in 2002 or 2003. How long did he stay in prison for? Um, I think it was about seven years from memory, and then he was granted parole. What you know, there was a bit of an outcry about that, but he, he was granted parole, and I, as far as we know, he's not been in trouble since. He got out and went off into the, the community and yeah. just kept his head down. Uh, you know, I'm not usually one of the lock him up brigade, but the idea that you could do this crime in 2002 and be released in 2009 seems incredible. Um, what do we know about his life since being released then? My colleague, Caro Mingyi, tried to track him down. Uh, now, she got hold of his brother and had a, quite a good chat to him. The brother said that he's in, in touch with Terence on and off, but he's a pretty private person. He's um, 
keeps his head down, never talks about the offending. He's never explained himself to his family and he's never apologised for it. You know, his brother told us at the Herald that, you know, of, of course we think he's sorry, but he's, it's just never been discussed. So, I got an email from Jane. She says, we lived, used to live next door to Terence on Waiheke. My daughter used to visit him and ride on the back of his sheep. She was about six or seven. He was always very pleasant. The kids enjoyed his company and we were shocked to hear what he'd done. <laughs> So the yeah. neighbours did love him on Waiheke. His <laughs> really? landlord, he had, he had mates. They all thought he was this lovely man who took great care of the rental property. And yeah, I imagine they were very shocked. Okay, not quite the end of the story though, because actually, Baby Car, who didn't stay with Donna and Eddie Jury. No, so soon after um, this all happened, her dad decided that it was best for Kahu to come back and be raised by the family. Now, when. Um, She was born. They, I think, were struggling and they'd considered giving her up uh, to foster care. They had some other children and it was just a bit much. That was another reason she went with Donna and Eddie. But after this, her father, uh, Pitipi, decided that, no, you're coming home. This is just, you know, a bit too much and we'll we'll raise you. Out of the limelight. Yeah. So she went from having this this life with these two incredibly high-profile, affluent, you know, people to just a really simple life out in rural New Zealand, which she has loved. And the baby is now 18 years old. Yeah. And she spoke to your colleague at the Herald. She did. So Caro tracked her down. She's um, living on the outskirts of Rotorua and still with family. She was just about to finish school. Um, she told us that she really wanted to be an actress, but she's quite quite a shy girl, quite a quiet, um, very smart, very well-spoken, lovely young woman. She says she just loves her quiet life and she sometimes thinks about what it could have been, you know, had she stayed with Donna and Eddie. Um, but she's really happy with, with how things have turned out and, um, you know, the, the biggest thing for her is she knows what's happened and she knows that she was baby Kahu, but, um, you know, she's not let it define her and she's just wanting to get on with her life and just be Kahu. And she doesn't remember anything? Not a thing. She said the... Um, the most she's learned about it was from reading something in a woman's mag later on that her dad had kept for her and, you know, she had questions and they were all answered and it it just doesn't fascinate her. You've been listening to Crimes NZ with me, Jessie Mulligan. You can find more episodes in this series on the RNZ Podcasts page. It's also on Apple, Spotify, iHeart and wherever you catch your favourite podcasts. Don't forget to follow the series, and if you enjoyed it, give it a rating to help others find it too. When you've finished this series and you're looking for the next great listen, try Gone Fishing or Black Sheep. They're both award-winning true crime podcasts from RNZ. Thanks for listening to Crimes NZ. I'm Jesse Mulligan.